friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise, and I once tried to swallow a Jeep. Hi, Claire, how's it going? I'm eating a Jeep. Good. Whether you think snakes are adorable, like I do, or scary, you have to admit that snakes showcase some incredible feats of evolution. Their most dramatic might just be their ability to swallow something that could be five times bigger than their own head. It is absolutely incredible, and today we are going to be deep diving into the mysteries of snake faces. Just so you are all aware, because we will be talking about how snakes are able to eat gigantic food relative to the size of their heads, there will be footage of snakes feeding on frozen thawed rodents and maybe some chicken hearts in this video. I really hope you all stick through the whole video because this whole thing is really interesting and it's obvious that I am awesome and fun to watch, but if feeding is something that makes you uncomfortable, you might want to skip this one. I'll understand. We're so cool. Now, for most animals, the size of the food they bring in is limited by the size of their mouth and how wide they can do this. Rigid jaws like ours, or a dog's, or a cat, or a squirrel, or whatever makes a good foundation for a strong bite, but are really limited with movement being able to primarily open in just one direction. How far we can open our mouths depends on how this hinge is configured and all of the muscles, skin, and stuff getting in the way. Snakes, as you might already know, have a bunch of extra goodies in their skull that allows them to move in ways unlike any other animal. You may have been told, taught, or read that snakes will unhinge their jaws. And here we go. Not only is it incorrect, they don't need to unhinge anything, it is also nowhere near as cool as what they actually do and what actually happens, and I'm gonna show you why. So stay and listen. The bones of the skull and jaw are a huge part of all of this, but before I get into the structure of the skull, I wanna start with the skin. The snakes' heads are covered with skin and scales, Usually, there are scales, and it doesn't matter how wide the jaw can open, if the skin is not flexible, it will keep everything wrapped tight. With the exception of scaleless snakes, like my scaleless corn snake goggles, a snake's body is completely covered, head to toe, so to speak, with tough, durable scales made primarily of keratin. Snakes spend a lot of time on the ground, moving over and through rough terrain. As prey animals, they face the teeth and claws of their predators, and sometimes even their own prey. And scales provide some added protection and serve an important function in locomotion. Rigid scales are a useful adaptation, but by definition, something that is rigid cannot be flexible. So how can snakeskin be covered in scales and still be super stretchy? The secret is in how these scales attach to the underlying skin. Each scale has an outer surface and an inner surface. The skin from the inner surface kind of hinges back on itself and forms like a little free area, which overlaps the base of the next scale. The result is an unbroken covering of overlapping scales. But the skin underneath is quite flexible and a big part of each scale is not attached to the skin. It means that they can slide away from each other as the skin stretches, and this is called scale spread which you can see if a snake has had a large meal or is gravid or chronically overweight. The scales in the area that needs to stretch most along the sides and around their neck and lower jaw tend to be much smaller than those on their back, belly, or top of their head. Add to that a slit under their jaw called a mental groove with a secret patch of extra skin tucked in there to allow even more stretching. This all allows greater surface area and the flexibility they need when they are swallowing large prey items. Now, it is no good being stretchy on the outside if you are not able to do the same on the inside. Snakes have that figured out too. The flesh inside of a snake's mouth has all sorts of folds and extra tissue tucked in there to facilitate stretching. I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, don't get ahead of me, because first we need to talk about breathing. Snakes have nostrils just like me and you, probably. I assume you have nostrils. And just like us, they use them to smell, yes. They smell with their nose, not their tongue. The tongue does have a role to play in how they process olfactory information using a different organ than what's in their nose, but they don't smell with it. Ooh, whole video here. <laughs> and also just like us, they use it to breathe a bit. Most of the air they breathe comes into their mouth through the rostral groove, the little hole at the front of their face that gives them a little kissy face. 
But when swallowing a meal, their entire mouth and throat is plugged up and choking down a big juicy rat can take a long time. Tassara, one of my doom rolls boas, will often take more than half an hour to swallow an extra large rat. So during that time, <laughs> thank you for demonstrating what not breathing is. So during that time, is she taking in less air by only breathing through the old snot holes? No, she can still breathe easily through her mouth. But how? Well, if we've learned anything by this point, it should be that snakes have evolved a solution for everything. Except this. They can't do this. But the breathing they can do with the help of a built-in snorkel at the bottom of their mouth. This tube-shaped structure here, just above their tongue sheath, is called the glottis and connects directly to the snake's windpipe. When eating, they extend their glottis out below or beside their meal, allowing them to bypass their food item and still get plenty of air. By forcefully exhaling through their glottis, many snakes can also generate their characteristic hissing noise that they use when threatened or grumpy. Demonstrate for us, my boy. Thank you, love. Oh boy. Some snakes, like bull snakes, have unique features in their glottis that make their hiss especially loud. Boas can even use theirs to growl. Which is so cool. It sounds so, yeah. Okay, so I need to circle back to the stretchy mouth folds. Oh, that just, uh, that sounds wrong and gross and awful to say. You wrote it. I know. Mouth folds, as gross as it sounds, is actually pretty cool and is also critical in how snakes drink. That little kissy face making little rostral groove is not just for pulling in air and allowing their tongue to flick out and collect information from the air. It is also how they drink. They stick this hole in water, a puddle, water dish, drop of dew, whatever. They get a good seal and rhythmically, They get a good seal and rhythmically contract some facial muscles to generate suction and slurp, sip up the water. Kind of like what we do with a straw, but so much cuter. I don't know what it is, but watching snakes drink is so adorable. If we can all collectively hold back our squeals of delight at how adorable this is, you can see Dozer here flexing the muscles in his head to create the suction to drink water off of his own body. Oh. My heart. So what's the big deal? They can suck up water. whoop de doo Well, this shouldn't be a surprise at this point. There's actually a lot more going on than it seems. You see, all that extra tissue folded up in a snake's mouth means that there is a ton of surface area. And this tissue is really good at attracting water. The ability for something to attract or stick to something else is called adhesion. Thanks to capillary action, the snake's mouth's water adhesion is stronger than the water's cohesion, its attraction to itself. So strong, in fact, that it can overcome gravity just like a sponge. They don't really need to use suction. They could just place their open mouth in water and just soak it up. I'm sure many of you watched Snake Discovery and you might remember the injured garter snake they had, Nearly Headless Nick. With his injury, meaning he was missing, well, a bunch of his face, Nick would not have been able to suck up water using suction and this spongy mouth adaptation would have been what allowed him to drink despite the damage to his face. Pretty cool, right? This is an excellent example of an exaptation, a trait that evolved for one purpose, but ends up being useful for something else. The extra folds and spongy mouth evolved to swallow huge food, but also had the added benefit of assisting with drinking. Neat, eh? Okay, we've covered the soft tissue adaptations that allow snakes to eat. Now let's get into the really cool stuff, the bones of their skull and how it all works. If you're one of the handful of folks who watched my first video on snake skulls, my two videos on snake skulls. You might recognize this, or you might have seen it in the background of some of my videos. It's a model of a snake skull. It is not to scale or, <laughs> to scale, uh. or perfectly anatomically correct. While not perfect, it will do a good job of demonstrating a snake's kinesthetic skull. Really, it's not bad for a bit of spray foam, toothpicks, and some wire. <laughs> and, uh, fly tying stand. <laughs> okay, so high level, all of the bones in a snake skull have some degree of mobility. This solid piece here is not solid on a real snake. There are multiple bones making up this part of the skull that they can kind of scooch about and uh, make some more room. The real magic though starts here with this bone called the quadrate. And it meets with, depending on the species, either the supertemporal or squamosal bone here. Right there, that little blue one, orange one connects to the blue one. 
quadrate, super temporal, squamosal. What these bones do is they move the pivot point from, I don't know, about here, where it would be on us, to way back here. What this does is allow for a much bigger gape and all of this area available for to stuff food into. But that's just the beginning. Our jawbone, well, most vertebrates really, is one solid kind of U-shaped piece. A snake's jawbone, called the dentary, is not. Where the solid chin would be on us, are flexible ligaments at the front of the snake's mouth that allow them to do this. Now, I am unhunching this one's jaw. In real life, snake's bones don't unhinge. They have ligaments, but I could not put together ligaments that wouldn't break apart this or be... It didn't work for the model, but just imagine there are stretchy ligaments. And these allow the snake's front of their mouth to swing laterally. Now we are talking about a hole like this to fit a meal into. Some snake's lower jaw bones even are split to front and rear portions, connected by ligaments, again, imagine. Meaning that they can further lengthen or flex their lower jaw and extend their gape even more. Pretty impressive, right? Some of these bones that allow snakes to open so incredibly wide, we have two. We just use them in a completely different way. In our ears, we have three tiny bones that help us hear. They are some of the very same bones that allow snakes' jaws to pivot. A snake's need to open wide was far greater than their need for sophisticated hearing, so the bones evolved to facilitate a wide gape. We can chew our food, so those bones weren't needed to open wide, and evolution hijacked them to help us in a way that we did need. So cool. Snakes can still hear without these bones, by the way. It's a myth that they're deaf but they do rely more on vibrations picked up through their jaw to send signals to their internal ears than vibrations through the air like we do, but rest assured, they can hear. I mentioned earlier that the rest of the bones in the snake's skull are not fused like ours either. This gives them the ability to flex around their food too. Their upper jaw has an inner and outer part that move independently of each other. The outer anterior part of the jaw is called the maxilla, which is like this bone here on us, and has a bunch of teeth. These are toothpicks, but again, imagine teeth. On rear fang snakes like hognose snakes, garter snakes, or false water cobras, right back here would be where the rear fang is. The inner posterior part of the jaw is made up of the pterygoid bones. In humans, and many other animals. These bones help form our palates at the roof of our mouth. In snakes, they attach to the rest of the skull with ligaments and can move independently and are often home to two additional rows of backwards pointing razor sharp teeth. Independent movement of the upper jaw bones allows the snakes to use something called jaw walking or pterygoid walking. It's kind of an alternating side to side motion with their pterygoid bones and it's very effective to pull food deeper into the mouth. It's almost like a conveyor belt, like grabbing and pulling back and grabbing and pulling back and grabbing, like with each side. The model here, we weren't able to make it so that this could move, but imagine that this goes forward and pulls back. Once the food is down and the snake is done misshaping their heads, they will spend a bit of time realigning their bones. You'll see them yawning, wiggling their jaw side to side, and all sorts of other motions to get things reset. So we've got the mechanics of how they do the sorted, and it is very impressive, right? But there are limits. They can't just swallow anything. Their food needs to be the right size and orientation to get down. Generally speaking, most snakes will maneuver to eat their prey head first. Rodents, rabbits, which aren't rodents by the way, deer, goats, they're all kind of pointy at the head, relative to the other end at least, and gradually get bigger. It is much easier for a snake to open up a bit, start with the head, and then gradually open wider as they swallow, versus starting with a big blocky rear end. Eating butt first is often possible too, just not easy. But there are always those weirdos who do things the hard way. I think anyone who keeps garter snakes will know what I'm talking about. I have four species and all of them will actively bypass the head and grab and eat their prey butt first. I've noticed my hognoses do that too, and as I understand, it is not uncommon with indigo snakes either. And I think that this comes down to how these snakes tackle their prey. For most snakes, their food is dead before it's swallowed, allowing them to line up their meal at their leisure. Venomous snakes kill their prey with venom before they eat. Constrictors constrict, you get it. But garter snakes, hognoses, indigos, and some others don't have time for that. Their strategy in the wild is just to overpower their prey. 
they grab it and start dragging it around to exhaust it while eating it alive. Hognoses and garter snakes do have mild venom to help subdue their prey, but it's not potent enough to quickly kill. Imagine having to fight your hamburger while you eat it. That's what they do. Eating a live, still fighting prey face first poses a lot of risks. If their prey has teeth and claws, the front end is usually where they keep them. And there is a lot of sensitive bits a snake would rather not have bitten. Glottis, tongue, eyes, their insides, like, right? It's much safer for a garter or hognose, whatever, to grab from behind and let the prey just exhaust themselves while the venom slowly does its work. By the time the snake gets to the biting end, the prey is all out of fight, exhausted, or even dead at that point, and gulp, down it goes. This is just my hypothesis. I haven't explored it fully, but I think it's a reasonable explanation for why my garter snakes refuse to eat head first more often than not. What do you think? When you watch a snake eat for the first time, it looks almost impossible. Understanding how they can make that happen doesn't make it any less fascinating. I hope you enjoyed learning about snakes, incredible adaptations to be able to eat huge meals without being able to chew or pull off bite-sized chunks. It's pretty cool, right? A special thanks to my friends on Patreon whose support allows me to make cool videos like this. These are awesome and super interesting folks. In fact, this patron here, they collect hotel do not disturb signs. Pretty neat, eh? Thank you all for watching. Please hit that like button. And until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> of our jawbone called the dentuary. The dentuary. The dentary. Ooh. I like how he wiggles and tries to leave. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> like that. I was resting my hand on him and he was like, ew. No. Humans are touching me. Ew. That would be so cool, right? Right, baby? You just need your hugs and kisses. <laughs>